Hello to the Queensland Poetry Festival. It's Jaya Savage here, uh, speaking to you from London. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Jundabadi First People of Yarun or Bribey Island, where I grew up, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging on the land there that was never ceded. Thanks to the Queensland Poetry Festival for inviting me uh, to join in the celebration of the Thomas Shapcott uh, Poetry Prize, or the anniversary thereof, which I was fortunate enough to win back in 2004, um, which led to the publication of my first collection, Late Comers, uh, published by UQP in 2005. It really was such a tremendous boost to win that award, so thank you to everybody involved in the prize, and I'd also like to acknowledge um, Thomas Shapcott too. So I'll read you a, a short poem, a very short poem from this um, collection. Uh, and in the first line of this poem, the word aphasia appears, which refers to um, an, uh, an inability to formulate uh, language or a forgetting of the ways to construct language, usually as a result of damage to a certain part of the brain. West End. This gentle aphasia washes over us like fabric softener. There's excess, then there's power, auto-cycling its load, spinning us semi-dry. The clothesline goes bung. One of the important strings has become unstrung, and as the swing set on the plateau projects arcs eastward, a stray cat gorges on extra quisquettes. What are the best odds you can give me on the West winning back-to-back -back millennia? The Boundary Street Festival promises to be the most memorable yet. Thank you again. I would like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turrbal people as custodians of the land on which this poem is recorded. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge Tom Shapcott for the privilege of having his name attached to my poetry. Sweeping the light back into the mirror, number nine. I write the word mute into the condensation on the window, breathe across it again, and write your name, then lick the letters off the glass, pretending my tongue is a mop for souls. We have the evenness of our hands to survey the unevenness of our lives. Hello. I'm Angela Gardner. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, Jagara and Turrbal people, on whose land I wrote the poem that I'm going to read, Three Positions Acting on Space. I'm currently living in Ireland. In 2006, I won the Thomas Shapcott Award, and in 2007, my book Parts of Speech was published. It changed my career. Um, I have now got uh, five collections and a verse novel. Um, so it's been a, a complete and utter uh, change to, uh, to have won the award. And I, I wish to thank um, those who are involved in that. Um, the poem I'm going to read is called Three Positions Acting on Space, and it, around the time of winning the Thomas Shapcott, it won the uh, Idiom 23 Bauhinia Award for an individual poem. Uh, it, this poem was written when I was living with my stepson, who was at the time age 15 and um, hadn't quite worked out his place in the world, um, and that is uh, the subject of the poem. It's called Three Positions Acting on Space. The admirable acquire a do-something list. The living go out, just one speaking pocket arrayed with cash. Fed up with moral tales. Look, I want to see a movie more like life, not walled from fear, but with a half-hospitable mouth and photo-flash blue edge. He leaves the cauterized words, sweet as, sweet as, efficient as any mechanism. How unlikely, after all, is perfection? Can you quite? 
Do I? You? What improper but continuous trace on skin. Close as it is to no-go, but all good. Look, can we get just get some lights? Softly, can we get some? Then to her, true, fuck yeah, true. The centre of demand again. Sun has no bearing on this heat, an instrument grains sideways. He walks, an end appears, that is all. Listen, now we are going to dinner, more eyes than ears, we make conversation until the menu befriends us. Scorned comical in the bar, avoiding parody, behind closed doors, conceived passion, a distance measured not by our bodies, palaces conjured from air, empty of furniture, not discussed even with him. The side gate left open, he thinks, paper wishes. No day set aside for reflection, the domesticity of unanswered houses bleeds into the road. Selvage to great risk, a voice explains with scant for him, three positions on the untenable. Since here some reason misled the cause, not as it is, not where it should be, not even when it is. While we worry about effect, transformative relationships, inwardness, classifying the fixity of objects, mortgages, or if we remember to water the garden and turn off the iron, wake up at three still in need of reassurance. Maybe you're right. It's not all it's cracked up to be. No galvanic lights. Just maybe not. Thank you very much. Venery, after Thomas Wyatt. Whoso list to hunt, I know where is and hind. You slip away. I raise my crop and fly the moon boned straight, this sudden gait and sweat flanked crest, this stretch of disappointed sky, suspended in your absence, blooded, hooked, my ankle's plank disturbs the night's slow pulse. You love me more, perhaps, than I love you, and yet. You take the deer's part every time, leaving me these boots, this gun, my jealous chafing thighs, my trying not to give the game away. But then this small box heart I brought you here tonight is fresh and iced and makes me think of days when I wore fox fur, smiled my shot glass smile. And Lord, I had no time for men like you, of whom I find there is a dearth, alas. Hi, my name's Rosanna Lakari, and I'm in Annerley, Brisbane, on Jagera and Turlbolt land. I'm going to read you a poem from my collection, An Absence of Saints. It's called Plantings. The clear sky is streaked with bird's song and the mists cross the fields slowly. It's morning. On the windowsill, a camellia from your mother's garden. Time has softened the stamens and bronzed the crimson petals. Slipping under the wire fence at the back, the dog follows as you run to the edge of the scrub, seeds in your pocket. There, the tracks of an animal. You step into the prints and beyond the crisp air of boyhood. The voice of the wind comforts you as you brush the rocks with your hand and take in the lichen scent. Walking the days, months, years, your gestures weave into the grasses and waiting shadows. Now, along this path, the creaking of old branches, lizards dart through the drying leaves, sunless bellies cool with caution. 
your voice I hear in the clearing near the grove where as a child you planted so many seedlings. You move among the branches and declare more ambitious plantings, corridors, rooms of trees built across the mountain. And here it gives you pleasure to stroke the bark of the eldest and say its Latin name. Thank you. Hello. I acknowledge the Yagara, Durable and Yagamba traditional owners of South East Queensland and pay respect to Elders past, present and those to come. This is Nicholas Powell, uploading and refreshing today from Finland. The poem is Psyche Rides. The mind the size of the fist, red raw from a spar with the wall, sizes up the birch arrowing into blue. In the fist, opening in sync with tulips, a shared impulse to flourish and an inclination to peace. A soft body and still mind after a night of rain and dreams, whose residues drift and settle and assemble again our bodies from scratch. Thunder is either a wheelie bin rolled in or through fields drawn with lilies of the valley, psyche riding lopsidedly an unroadworthy automatic chariot. Jackknife, incised circle work with one wheel off the uneven earth of spud and tuft. At the field's far edge, a horse looks on in its neutral fashion. Light gilds her outline. I'm coming to you from Chicago, the ancestral homeland of multiple tribes, including the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi tribes, and which is still home to the third largest native population in the U.S. today. I'm Ray Briggs. I'm the author of Free Logic, which I published under a different name, but here I am, same poet. And I'm going to read you the title poem, Free Logic. Last week, we learned the logic of the gap-toothed pond, the rotting log, the flip-foot tadpole, halfway frog, the muddy, half-unknitted glove, the grackle, neither black nor green, but somewhere in between. This week, it's things that don't exist. We'll start in slow with Santa Claus, or St. Bernard's with purple paws. Although the things that don't exist peel off like paint from those that do, they have a logic too. Some of them are solid as the marathon you might have run, the ache, the way your sneakers spun, heel over heel, or else the jazz guitar you might have learned to pluck, or else your winning luck. They breed beneath the grackle glow, where aspen leaf and ostrich frond knit sweaters for the gap-toothed pond. The tadpole tail swims off to nowhere. The wood falls off in barky bits. The glove unknits. Hi, it's David Stavanger here. Um, reading from my 2014 Shapcot winning collection, which I still, it's still a beautiful thing to, to, to know that's part of my journey. You shouldn't use the journey word in poetry, but anyway, um, as part of the 20th anniversary of the award, I'm reading and coming from, reading on and coming from Darawal land on, in the Illawarra in Wollongong. And I'm reading from a poem from the special, uh, it's called Jack the Moon. I've moved into the shed, he said, fast and from a distance beyond telephone wire and cars. Listen to this. And I could hear Perry Como needle sharp bouncing off hollow tin walls. The back shed, it's better out here. I bought the phone out so that we can talk. 
He sounded more triumphant than drunk, a man who'd drawn a thin line then crossed it. I asked him about the lack of windows and whether Nan knew about the relocation. He didn't hear me, manic and proud, sitting on a camp bed with the insects. I'm going to stay out here. I'm going to press tongues. David, look at what I've done. I'm in the shed. Blood lithium free and cycling, machine gun thoughts, all buttons pressed at once. Madness is not fully measured by the harm done. It's in the beauty only lunar suns undo. Who was I at 17 to deny the ascent? Thanks very much and happy birthday to the Shabcott. Hi, I'm Chrissy Neen and I'm coming to you from the lands of the Yagra and Turrbal people. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. I'm reading today from my collection, uh, Eating My Grandmother, A Grief Cycle. The carpet is an underfoot irritation. The bedspread, nauseous. Peering up each day at a cliche of dolphins leaping from their printed waves. We are near the ocean. Beyond the frosted window, I watch the empty car park, but for a utility parked at an awkward angle. Beyond, a scant town sucks the last from a poisoned land. Cars rust. Plumbing crunches over with salt. There is no sound of ocean, but the crow flies there more easily than four-wheel drives, scraping airless hours down a potholed strip of dirt to drip their tyres in water. This motel waits for decay to dig over into retro chic, rotted linoleum stylish at a squint, hugs the crusted basin. I squint, not for the linoleum. The cloud puffs up as I pour her body, decanting part of her into a vessel, clear, watertight, half-priced from Bunnings. Keepsake, her burned and ground up bones, her gritty breath, her dehydrated blood, for keep's sake. What part of her have I secreted away? Her hand, which struck out to show affection, eschewing hugs for slaps. Her legs, which she was proud of, admired in tiny shorts till she was 85. Perhaps I have the ground up thigh bone, knee, ankle, skull, mind sharp as a splintered glass, eyes, tattooist needle. I have her fingerprint on me in hot black ink. Breath shudders in, wetted by unshed tears. Acidic, a chemical sting at the back of my throat. This is not the taste of human flesh. I wonder in that breath if I am holding a plastic vial of air freshener, toilet cleaner, a potpourri of chemical equations. I wonder if one taste will harm I wonder about death for the first true time. I know death in the abstract. I have followed a slippery eel of consciousness, tracked its path onward into death, the earth, another living thing. Here now, this acrid taste of death is something else. This granular piece of her, good for nothing more than cat piss, or to gravel line the bottom of aquariums, sanitized with poison, fish floating, belly lolling. She might kill me if I ate her, tiny stone by stone. I pick a fragment of my grandmother, balanced. I swallow without thought or taste. I wait to see my death. When she dies, I die. This simple sum, one thing equal to another, A equals B, because I have always believed it to be so. When she dies, equals I die. Because it is only her indomitable will holding the world in place. When she dies, I die. And yet here I am. They tell me she is dead. And here I am, undead, 
numb, heavy. Yes, the world has stopped or I have stopped. Like a chicken running around a yard, still trying to escape the fallen cleaver, I am upright. Perhaps A does not equal B. Or I am dead, as Jules Cotard. My feet reek. My cunt is fragrant with decay or dying. I take another grain and put it on my tongue and swallow. I must save some of her. I must bury some of her. For mother, aunt, for my mother, aunt, for their loss, which is my loss. I will die from this blood sacrifice, falling on the death pyre of my queen. I am already dead. I feel the scratch of her fingernail tracking my trachea. This weight of chemical gravel is not all of her, and what I take is part of part. But I will eat what I have been given. I will eat my grief into a stone that will stick in my gut. When I have feasted on what remains, of remains, then what? Hi, I'm Stu Barnes. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm recording, the Durrumbul people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. In the spirit of kinship, I'm going to read a poem called Matrimonies, which is a chanto from Gwen Harwood uh, from my book, Glass Houses. Matrimonies. Their delicate armies sway the ambiguities of space. Feel in your hands before you play, trembling in warmth and rising the agitation of the strings. It would be comforting to sing to the solid mercy of water. Grasshoppers click and whir. I am high on acid rock, on wandering glitter. I feel your pulse beat through my fingertips. Look where the grass grows more intense, grows luminous in distance, shaping my lips. I lie among dazzling visions, lying to the fine edge of clarity. The season for philosophy draws on. Sparrows flock to my pond. Verses flow in a never-ending torrent. Death has no features of his own. Music's much more than flesh and bone. What's all this but the language of illusion? Hello, I'm Shastra and I live, work and write on the stolen land of the Agora and Turrbal people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Um, I'm very grateful to Queensland Poetry and to Arts Queensland for 20 years of the Thomas Shapcott Poetry Prize. And today I'm going to be reading from my collection, The Agonist, which won the 2016 Thomas Shapcott Poetry Prize. The poem I'm reading is called Salt Sugar. You never told me how it happened, bones trembling beneath your skin, Fluid collecting in your joints, vertebrae ready to snap as the pressure built at the base of your skull. On autopsy, they found bubbles in your brain, your lungs swollen and soaked in seawater, ribs caved in. Paradoxical breathing, your documented cause of death. They didn't stop searching until they found the sorrow tucked away in your thoracic viscera, the longing distilled in the pedicle of your liver, hunger hidden in the mitral valve of your heart, didn't stop until they had you cut and gutted like a mackerel on a Sunday afternoon. In the low light, your hands shone phosphorescent like fish scales. Somewhere, the sea stretches out for you, gleaming with promise. Pass me the salt, sugar. You smelled of old empires and the smoke of sacrifice because salt preserves and it purifies. You had the sea in your veins before they filled you up with chemicals. Pass me the shovel, lover. It's just you and me and I'm still waiting for you to get up and walk away. 
Thank you. Um, I hope we have 20 more years of this prize and 20 more years of the books that it brings us. Thanks very much. Hi everyone. My name is Ray White. My pronouns are they, them. And today I'm filming from the lands of the Yagara and Turrbal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Today I'm reading from my collection Milk Teeth, which won the 2017 Thomas Shapcott Poetry Prize. Congratulations to the prize for 20 years. Here's to 20 more. Uh, this poem is called Blizzards Expected Throughout the Week, and it's about the migration of caper white butterflies through southeast Queensland um, that happened in 2016. Blizzards Expected Throughout the Week. Doesn't snow here in Brizzy, except this humid pre summer when frosted gusts of caper whites coat sticky sky. At first, we count them, but the forecast predicts millions. So we lays on the patio, whispering as honeycomb wings surf westerly winds. Stray butterflies tumble our way, slip against moisture slit glasses, dab at sweat like nectar on our legs. Thank you so much for listening to my poem uh, from Milk Teeth and once again congratulations to the Thomas Chapcott Poetry Prize for 20 amazing awesome years of poetry. Thank you. like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am speaking, writing and creating, the Yagara and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Hi, I'm Anna Jacobson and I'll be reading a poem from my collection, Amnesia Findings. You just wanted to show me how the sun rippled off the water onto your skin. You cupped the light alive in your hands, reeled it in, made a golden ball of yarn. In quick clicks, you stitched me a pair of socks. I pulled them on, felt the heat pulse in my soul, sensed the light wanting to return to the sun. I peeled off the socks, unraveled the thread. You didn't mind. You just wanted to show me you could knit with light. I'm recording this in Beijing. Today I'll be reading a poem from my book at the altar of touch. And the title of the poem is Myth or Luck as a Swan Boat. Myth or Luck as a Swan Boat. Fear, fear, shriek the ancient cicadas in the borrowed language all summer long. It forms a pattern, the cut diamond of their chorus shredding air into thin ribbons of heat. An abandoned fountain, dry as the loins of any stone cherub. I go where chance takes me, where the luck, the sun bleached swamp boat, steered by nothing but the lake's capras through the knot of shadows cast by a willow grove. That shadow play of mind, foliage, mind, foliage, until the water turns murky as unanswered prayers. Chance, a cold word for surrender. Prayers, 
a prelude to trust. I lie down beside the rock, worn to myths by the lake's ancient murmurs. The boat I came in has turned to a swan. The swan now saunters towards me as a god. Fear ebbs from me in ripples tainted by the moon as I seek the rare kind of tenderness that lies between rescue and ruin. Guiding the god's feathered touch over the ivory magnolia of my belly, steering his calloused hands over mine, saying, here are the wars, here is the impossible rowing. Hello, I'm John Kamalvata. I'll be reading the first part of the triptych from Blackbirds Don't Make Me Stalks. I'm middle-aged, overweight, tires around my waist. When I see them pull down statues, their rage is my rage. Their anger is my anger. It comes from the same place. I've got a lifetime of it built up, yet with me or in my way. Skinny little brown boy, immigrant fresh. They're quick to show you you're different from the rest. Went from sunny skies at home, where brown was all I'd known, to grey skies and cloud where brown men you stood alone. Racist kids weren't the problem. It was racist teachers who used their power to put you down and the history they teach us. Those distorted stories is where this cancer starts. You're going to have a warped view if you don't know your past. They sanitise their stories, emphasise their glories, don't tell you how deep the gore is or how twisted the law is. Don't let your schooling get in the way of your education, son. They tell you Wilberforce freed the slaves, don't tell you Haiti freed itself. Then slave-owning nations made it pay reparations, 21 billion till 1947. Now you understand why it's an impoverished nation. Britain paid compensation when it set the slaves free, paid to those who held slaves in captivity, 300 billion in today's currency. From 1835 to 2015, that debt to slave-earning families has been paid no matter the colour of your skin by every British taxpayer there's ever been, including me. Namdaris and sepoys tied to cannons back sarged. Heads flew 40 feet when they detonated the charge. Churchill's Bengal famine killed more than 3 million. You can interchange photos from Bengal to Belsen. The difference you'll see is the colour of the victims. While Conran and Quant were making a name on the King's Road, in the Queen's name, the British built concentration camps. Hooked men to wires, ramped up the amps, broken bottles in vaginas, sliced off testes, beat Kikuyu to death while starvation and disease took their families. These are the savages who say they civilised us, built our schools, built our railroads, built our countries from the dust. For all this, they said we should give them thanks. They forget to tell you they made their money off our backs. This is Empire's story, and we're all Empire's children. They're fooling you and me with their tales they're telling. It's called whitewash for a reason. They left the truth on the shelf because they don't have the courage to be honest with themselves. Thank you. (laughs) 